Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis. This is week two and I'm Vicki Colvin. What we're going to be doing in this next two weeks is talking about instrumental methods that allow us to analyze for elements. Sometimes I'll just call this metals analysis, but I mean it much more broadly. Pretty much any element in the periodic table with some key exceptions can be analyzed with the atomic spectroscopies we'll be talking about this week and next. So what's going to happen in this first week of a section on elemental analysis is we're going to be talking about atomic spectroscopy. It is the tool to use. And I'm also going to be introducing you to your case study. So the lectures this week are broken down into roughly eight or nine parts, depending on how they pan out. We'll be working from the next two segments, which are going to be really focused on the case study and sample preparation. Then I'll get into the guts of atomic spectroscopy. And then finally, in the last two lectures, we'll talk about how to select a method. So the analysis of elements is an incredibly important area. So before we kind of dig in to what all the methodologies are, I want to spend some amount of time telling you about all the different ways that these, this kind of information can have an impact on the world. And in particular, I want to drill down into your case study for week two and three, which is focused on the analysis of lead in children's toys. When you, think, when you think about elemental analysis, one of the really interesting things about it is that it can be applied in so many different arenas. If you own a fish tank, you care a lot about the calcium and magnesium that might be present in it. If you, for example, are building buildings, you might want to analyze the type of stainless steel that's being used. In the study we're going to talk about this week, uh, it's the amount of lead that might be present in children's toys. And then finally, of course, things that might be present in your drinking water, like chromium. All of these examples require some kind of elemental analysis of relatively complex samples in a quantitative fashion in order for important decisions to be made. And that's one of the themes, I think, in a lot of analytical chemistry is that the information that we're measuring actually informs decisions or it helps a company. And so that context is really, really important to understand. So the question of why we do instrumental analysis is something that's really important for me to explain and to at least let you grapple with. And the reason is that by asking the question, how much lead is perhaps in this rattle that this baby is chewing on, we can better understand if the baby is at some sort of risk of lead poisoning or maybe how to make the toy better so it doesn't contain lead. And the reason I picked the case study partly because it's an interesting one, and partly I want you to see instrumental analysis and the concept that we're learning in some kind of context. And the reason for that is if you study, for example, what it means to describe the error bar of lead in a toy, you're going to have a couple of different things happen that don't happen when you just read it from a book or you listen to one of my video lectures like from last week. First of all, you're going to remember better what you learn if you learn it in some kind of context. So if you know the big picture about why you're making the measurement, a lot of what we're talking about will actually stick with you better. The next thing is that it helps you apply your knowledge. We all know that sitting in a class or watching videos is no substitute for the real world. And in the real world, all of us have to take our knowledge and try to solve a problem, apply it. And so the case studies are my attempt to get you to begin to make those connections and see that some of the topics we're learning in class actually connect to much broader sets of issues that you really have to grapple with in order to understand how to do the analysis in the right way. Finally, I think it's important to develop critical thinking skills. I'm going to be giving you reading material this week, and part of your job is to ask questions about it, to think it through, to decide, wow, this makes sense, or, you know, I didn't like that. I didn't think they did it right. So, you know, go ahead and be critical of the reading. That's fine. And that's part of what you're doing is really beginning to look at what does analytical chemistry literature look like? What do professional analytical chemists write down? And how does that connect to some of the underlying principles that I'm teaching you in the class? Okay, on to the case study. So lead is really the central element of this case study. And it's an important element in the world at large, and it's also quite toxic to people. It's not that abundant. You don't find lead in a huge fraction of the Earth's crust, for example, but over thousands of years, people have learned the value of using lead in a variety of different applications. First in metallurgy, later we find it as additives in plastic. It's a very good colorant. And so lead has really permeated our society, and you find it in a lot of different contexts. The problem is, is that it can be very toxic to people. Adults, not so much. You really got to swallow a lot of lead and get up to very high blood levels before you have acute lead poisoning. A more insidious problem is what happens with children. Lead actually mimics calcium in biological systems. And what that means in the development of the brain in particular, that lead when it's present at high enough concentrations, not 
not enormous, but 10 micrograms per deciliter of blood, for example, can really wreak havoc on cognition, on memory, and it's particularly focused on these early develop developmental years from infants up until about the age of six. And so in the real world, lead poisoning is a really big issue. It used to come from lead paint more frequently, and currently the concerns have to do more with toys. So in this case study, I've created a fictional world for you. And your task is actually to understand the company I'm calling Toys Inc. That's toys with a Z. And a couple of things you need to know about the company before we get into your job. First, a watchdog non-governmental agency or an NGO actually found and published that 20% of the toys sold by the company you work for in this case study contained lead at quantities that were considered to be highly dangerous to children. That, of course, had a big impact. Basically, the consumer Basically, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, or the CPSC of the United States, ordered the recall of millions of toys made by Toys, Inc. That meant that the company had to spend $30 million in that recall. But more than that, consumer confidence in the company was hurt because kids were actually really having a hard time because they were eating, swallowing, mouthing these toys, and as a result, were experiencing a wide range of health care. Your job is to actually help the company fix these problems. So your mission is actually to come into the company as an analytical chemist and help them design an analytical lab that will meet their needs. So the context of the measurement that I'm placing you in is a company, a company that's had a bad experience with lead in its toys that needs to address it. And I think one of the things I hope you're going to get from this whole experience of thinking about your case study is that when you do atomic spectroscopy to measure lead and you think about the air and everything I'm going to hopefully teach you, you have to think about the context. Why are you making the measurement? What matters to the company? What matters ethically? What matters financially? How do you as an analytical chemist best meet the needs of your customer? One of the other things that you have to do, and this can be very difficult for students, is you've got some big picture. Company doesn't want this to ever happen again. That may be all you know. You have to translate that need and that desire into a set of concrete measurement needs. What is it you got to measure when and in what way so that you best meet the needs of this particular context? I call those measurement needs. You're going to have to be able to select an instrument or maybe plural instruments. You're going to talk about sample preparation and the methodologies that you'll use to take the measurements. And finally, I'm going to ask you to make some comments about quality assurance and quality control in the fictional analytical lab that you're setting up. So really what the output is of the case study, which remember goes on for two weeks, so you're going to do a lot of reading. I'll talk about it in the video lectures. And in the end, you're going to produce a document. It's relatively short, a page or two, which addresses these issues in a very structured way. And you are going to have the experience of grading the work of your peers in this. So this is going to be a peer grading exercise. We'll do three case studies throughout the semester, and this is the first one. So let me give you some background that will save you some time in the reading. First of all, your company is based in the US, although it sells toys all over the world. So you need to know US regulatory policy, because part of what the company has to do is comply with a new set of regulations that are actually published about how companies who sell toys should measure their lead. So a little bit of history. In actually 2011, late 2011, toys were basically set to have at most 90 parts per million lead, and that's milligrams per kilogram of lead. So while we saw PPM in the solution phase, this is different. This is now in the solid phase. So toys really cannot be sold if they have greater than that content of lead. Interestingly enough, the CPSC doesn't allow companies themselves to make that measurement. What they'd like you to do is send out samples to certified laboratories that have actually gone through a set of quality assurance and quality control measures such that they are certified by the CPSC to make accurate and precise measurements of the lead content of toys. You then, when you get that data back, issue a certificate about that particular toy saying we meet the CPSC requirements for lead content in toys. So it's really something you have to do to third party laboratory. And finally, a key issue of your context, you might say, well, then why does Toys Inc. need an analytical lab? They're just going to ship their samples off to a third party. Well, you can reflect upon that yourself. That's part of the case study. But clearly, there's a lot of advantages to understanding how much lead you might have in your toys. You might think, what would happen if you sent out a whole batch of, I don't know, new baby rattles three months before Christmas, and the CPSC laboratory found that they had really high contents of lead? 
probably need to be a little bit more proactive. And you might not want that kind of information in the hands of a third party laboratory whose actual first allegiance might be to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. You need to have in-house testing. And that was a decision that was made by both your CEO and your marketing department. And that's why they're going to invest in an analytical lab that's in-house. One of the first things you'll be grappling with is sample preparation. We're going to talk about this in the next mini lecture. But to make a long story short, there's nothing you can do with a piece of plastic in terms of analysis, or at least not very much. You got to dissolve it. All of the atomic spectroscopies we're learning about, which are called basically laboratory methods for lead analysis, require that the solutions be clear and contain very small numbers of what's called total dissolved solids. That's a term we'll talk more about later. So you got to basically dissolve plastic and metal. Um, non-trivial. And in fact, sample preparation and handling is one of the key issues that you have to face as an analytical chemist. This case will get you thinking a little bit about that. And your reading will help you select and think through what your processes might look like. You also have to decide on the measurement methods. Once you get the toys dissolved, how much lead is present? And that's also a really interesting question because Actually, there's not a lot of guidance. You have a bunch of things you could do. You could do atomic absorption spectroscopy, atomic emission, mass spectroscopy, and even X-ray fluorescence. So there's a lot of options. And one of the things I'll be teaching you in the next couple of lectures is all about what these terms mean. But part of your thing you're going to have to do in about two weeks is you're going to have to tell me which of these methods do you think is most suitable for Toys, Inc. and their particular context of their problem and what you've been hired to do in setting up their analytical labs. So outside reading will be absolutely required for this case study. It's super important to do this reading. And one whole quiz this week will be devoted to whether or not you did this reading. You can open up the stuff and look at the question and find the answer. Um, and that's simply because that's what you're going to do. Nobody's going to give you a million dollars to set up a lab and expect you not to really do a lot of research. So this is kind of a small taste. It's not a ton of pages, um, right around 30, depending on how much you do. But if you did do all this reading thoroughly, I think you'd be on a good start to understanding some of the larger issues that might control the questions that I'll be asking you to think about in your case study. These are all uploaded. They're going to be linked to this lecture. And you're also going to be able to find them on the course resources page. Um, I think I'll be calling it the case study page. So look for it there. The second thing is you're going to have to think about the measurement needs. What are the specific needs that flow from the context that you've described? So if the context is kind of loosey-goosey, a little bit touchy-feely, the measurement needs are going to get a lot more quantitative. Here's how many toys we're going to look at. Here's the concentrations of lead we might expect. Here are the kinds of things we're going to have to do in these measurements. And so I think that's going to be a little bit closer to what sort of the standard part of this class is. And then you're going to need to link the needs to the decisions you're going to make about sample prep and about measurement methodologies. So all of that's going to get wrapped up together and get produced as, like I said, about a two-page document. I thought about doing presentations, and I opted for documents instead. For this first round, they might be a little bit easier for the peer grading. Anyhow, thanks so much for listening to this first lecture of week two, and I'll see you soon.